It's very powerful and it makes sense to me that uh, caffeine stimulates critical thinking. I also drink lots of coffee when I'm writing uh, and I know it has played an important role in the lives of many scholars, many scientists, many artists. Balzac famously, um, whether it's true or not, we don't know, but it's said that he used to drink around 50 cups of coffee every day, every day. Voltaire uh, one of the, of course, leading figures of the Enlightenment. It is said that he used to drink 72 cups of coffee every day. Ludwig van Beethoven, he was um, famously obsessed with coffee. He would count, you know, the, the beads of coffee, 60 beads of coffee per, per cup. It had to be precise. So I find it very interesting that so many people become obsessed with coffee. But of course, it is not about the drink only. It's about the conversations. It's about the friendships. It's about the sisterhoods. It's about the love, the social ties and the cultural bonds that are formed around coffee and the secular spaces that we create. So I want to leave you with this proverb. In Turkish, we say just one single cup of coffee is remembered for 40 years. So So in one of my earlier videos, I spoke about love and I mentioned how we have fewer words for love to describe love than we have to describe coffee in our modern societies. And several uh, listeners afterwards also asked me to speak about coffee and I will gladly do so because I love coffee. Uh, I love coffee houses and I grew up in a house in which coffee was very important. My grandmother... Uh, like many Turkish women of her generation, she loved to read coffee cups and it was a ritual, you know, in, in her house. This house was, which was full of superstitions, uh, a lot of irrationality, lots of folklore, lots of oral storytelling and coffee was a big part of it. But of course, not only my childhood my, or my upbringing, there are studies that show all across the world today around 90% of adults consume some type of caffeine almost every day. So it has become an inseparable part of our lives. I also want to briefly mention the etymology of the word because it's so interesting as you move across languages, the word is very similar, whether it's Italian, Spanish, you know, English, Turkish. In Turkish, we say kahve, related to the Arabic word kahva, um, which also traces the journey of coffee from Africa into the Middle East, from the Middle East, through the Ottoman Empire, into Europe. And so by the time you reach 16th century, coffee is not only very popular, but so are coffee houses. You know, in almost 100 years, you see a proliferation um, of so many coffee houses, thousands of coffee houses all across Europe. And in many ways, it's quite an egalitarian drink because it is relatively affordable and many people from various cultural backgrounds are capable, you know, of consuming coffee. Of course, I'm not denying or I'm not ignoring the fact that coffee houses within the public spaces have been male dominated uh, areas. Um, but women have also consumed coffee. So it cuts across uh, the various strata of, of the society or across genders. I'm very interested in the works of the scholar, journalist Michael Pollan, who speaks, uh, who talks about the history of coffee and shows how actually coffee changed history. We never think of coffee as a mind altering drink as a psychoactive drug, um, but we need to think about, you know, the impact of coffee, what it does to our bodies, but also its social um, implications or social impacts or political impact. So I find Michael Pollan's work very interesting in that regard. Basically, what he says is that if it weren't for coffee, um, maybe we wouldn't have the Age of Enlightenment or even the Industrial Revolution in this way because it had a direct impact on the way human beings started to think in a much more linear, in a much more rational way.
Now, it's worth remembering that before coffee was introduced, and by the way, coffee is not that old. We're, we're talking about a relatively recent drink, yeah, right? Um, when you think of human history, the longevity of that, and you look at coffee, it's basically a few centuries old. So before we had coffee in our lives, many people in the Western world, I'm talking about the Western world mostly right now, used to drink some type of alcohol from breakfast onwards throughout their day. Even children would be given hard cider. Um, why? Because water was contaminated. So it was difficult to drink water. And so alcohol, it was easier. It was fermented and the bacteria in it were was not alive. Um, so it was healthier, actually, in that regard to drink some type of alcohol, but which means many people were, if, if not drunk, they were tipsy, they were buzzed with, you know, alcohol. So when you start drinking coffee, when you in, with the intake of caffeine, um, the way we think changes radically. I also, before I go forward, I also want to mention that within the Ottoman Empire, when I look at the journey of coffee, it's quite interesting because many rulers, especially authoritarian rulers, were very much aware that coffee houses were fast becoming hubs where people from completely different backgrounds could get together, uh, take their caffeine, you know, they wouldn't use these terms, but take their daily coffee and then start talking politics start talking about society or criticizing daring to criticize you know that kind of rational thinking that kind of critical thinking was encouraged by this drink but also these public spaces that were provided by coffee houses and not surprisingly many authoritarian rulers did not like that at all so just to give you an example one of our sultans in in in, in ottoman history his name was sultan murad the 4th he is famous for stalking for walking the streets side streets of istanbul in disguise looking for people uh, drinking coffee or looking for coffee houses that would be secretly open and punishing them it was you know many people were sentenced to death for drinking coffee during his reign, even though, of course, he himself loved to drink coffee. Um, so it's interesting to me to see that right from the very beginning, many rulers were aware of the social and political implications uh, of coffee. Now, coming back to Michael Pollan's analysis, I think it's, it's, it's very powerful and it makes sense to me that c uh, caffeine stimulates critical thinking. I also drink lots of coffee when I'm writing. Uh, and I know it has played an important role in the lives of many scholars, many scientists, many artists. Balzac famously, um, whether it's true or not, we don't know, but it's said that he used to drink around 50 cups of coffee every day. Every day. Voltaire, uh, one of the, of course, leading figures of the Enlightenment, it is said that he used to drink 72 cups of coffee every day. Ludwig van Beethoven, he was um, famously obsessed with coffee. He would count, you know, the, the beads of coffee, 60 beads of coffee per, per cup. It had to be precise. So I find it very interesting that so many people become obsessed with coffee. But of course, it is not about the drink only. It's about the conversations. It's about the friendships. It's about the sisterhoods. It's about the love, the social ties and the cultural bonds that are formed around coffee and the secular spaces that we create. So I want to leave you with this proverb. In Turkish, we say just one single cup of coffee is remembered for 40 years because with every cup of coffee, you know, with that smell, with that taste, what you bring to mind is um, your emotions, your memories. It triggers, it opens up bigger conversations and, and bigger memories. That's why when we drink coffee, I think it's worth bearing in mind the history and all the emotions and all the memories that, that are attached to that single cup of coffee. Say